So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event director and Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business. We credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending part of your evening with us. I'm really very thrilled today to welcome Emerald Garner to celebrate her memoir, Finding My Voice, in conversation with the book's co-authors, Aton Thomas and Monet Dunham. Um, now to some housekeeping before I properly introduce our guests, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also on the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections, so bear with any technical issues that could arise and we will try to resolve them quickly. Um, it's a really exciting time for books this fall, so and we have a really stellar lineup of in-person and virtual events for you. So head to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One event that I want to point out in particular is next Wednesday, October 19th. We're very thrilled to welcome George Saunders in person for the launch of his new story collection, Liberation Day, in conversation with Brandon Taylor. That program is up on our web website now and taking registrations. So if you're joining us from here in New York, we hope to see you there. So now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Emerald Snipes Garner is the youngest daughter of six children and is currently the executive director of the nonprofit We Can't Breathe, which is inspired by her late father, Eric Garner and her sister, Erica Garner. Emerald is the youngest daughter of Esau Snipes Garner and Eric Garner, who was murdered at the hands of now former police officer Daniel Pantaleo in 2014, after putting him in a now illegal chokehold. She has become the leading voice in the fight for justice for her father and has vowed to never stop fighting laws and policies that help police officers get away with murder. Emerald is echoing the warrior in her in memory of her sister, the late Erica Garner, who died from a massive heart attack as a result of her broken heart, fighting for justice for her father on December 30th, 2017. Emerald is the mother to Kaylee, who is 10 years old, and also the mother slash aunt to the two children of her late sister, Erica, Eric the third, or EJ, who is four, and Alyssa, who is 12. Emerald encourages everyone to use their voice as a form of expression in a peaceful way. And Aton Thomas, a former 11-year NBA player, was born in Harlem and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's published multiple books, including We Matter, Athletes and Activism, which was voted among the top 10 books on activism by Book Authority, More Than an Athlete, Fatherhood, Rising to the Ultimate Challenge, and Voices of the Future. Thomas was honored for social justice advocacy as the recipient of the 2010 National Basketball Players Association Community Contribution Award, as well as the 2009 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Foundation Legacy Award. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post and on Huffington Post, CNN, and, ESN, and, sorry, and ESPN. Uh, he can be frequently seen on MSNBC as a special correspondent, and he co-hosts a weekly local radio show, The Collision, on WPFW in DC, about the place where sports and politics collide. And born and raised in New York with a BA in theater and psychology from Vassar College and an MS in special education from Adelphi University, Monet Dunham is a retired multiple award-winning teacher of special needs students. Monet is also a musician, a singer-songwriter, actor, film director, and film casting director. Prior to retiring, she often used her artistic training and talents to implement programs for her students, including those legally blind, nonverbal, and emotionally and or physically homebound, by using music, technology, and other creative means to help facilitate and make learning enjoyable. As an actor, Monet has played key roles in several projects, including Just Another Girl on the IRT, which is now considered a cult classic, New Jersey Drive, uh, recent independent films Love Don't Last Forever, and multiple festival award-winning My King, and the very popular 2018 web series Best Frenemies. As a casting director, Monet cast Hal King the Movie, which is now available to stream. As a musician, she's released two full-length projects and one EP. Songs from these projects have been featured on the television shows Criminal Minds, The Mindy Project, and The Hill, as well as The Weather Channel. Monet's played flute on more than 30 projects and performed on stage with many artists, including Eric Robertson, Cy Smith, Tara Reynolds, and The Late Guru, and has recorded with Angela Johnson, DJ Spinna, Ty Causey, Tortured Soul, and many more. Monet's most popular songs are Spirit and Vain, which are both instrumentals, and Hold Me Sweetly, which she co-wrote and features her vocals. So without any further ado, I will leave it to you three, Emerald, Monet, Aton, thank you both. Thank you all three of you for joining us tonight. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So first of all, audience, all that about me is just so, you know, you realize I'm not a little small bean in the room with these giants that I've had the joy of, of working on this very, very important memoir. Um, Emerald is, I, I just have to give a lot of kudos, so bear with me while I gush, but Emerald is one of the most amazing um, human beings I have come to know. Uh, the good, the bad, and the wonderful, man, 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 fabulous. <laughs> But really, um, I'm super proud of her, and I am really and truly honored and humbled and just pleased out of my brain that she entrusted me and Atan to take her life and share it with the world and to pretty much just open up her whole, I don't know, just your whole spirit, and, and it's just been a real, real journey. And I'm glad that you realize how important it is for people to hear your story. And Atan, I'm so thrilled that you looked at this lovely cherubi being and said, yeah, she needs to be heard. And I'm going to definitely help this happen. And I'm going to take the two of y'all and make good and sure that people get the activism with the active subject. <laughs> so all that being thank said, you. thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're wonderful. Um, is there anything that has happened? I mean, obviously, I'm sure there has, but since the book has come out, I'm just curious, just across the board. I'm I'm gonna ask, I'm not gonna let you answer first, Errol. I'm gonna ask you first, Atan. Has anything different or anything happened at, since the book has come out? Because our book is just born October 4th, and it's really exciting. Like we, three people had a baby. It's so amazing. But <laughs> but has anything happened? Have have you had anything happen um, either from external sources or has anything happened inside of you as a result of us embarking on this journey? So interestingly enough, you know, a lot of people have been reaching out to me um, because they've seen the, the, the maturation process you know of emerald mm -hmm. and they you know they going back and you know seeing her finding her voice so they've seen it like in real time so a lot of people have reached out to me and just asked me questions like how is she how is she doing how you know it's wonderful that she's finding her voice you know it's and, and a lot of pouring out of support and one of the things that you know this is a different type of a book where um, it's really opening up a lot of painful um, wounds that haven't really closed, but, you know, you're opening them up more and more to the world. So there's a lot of people reaching out for requests to, because they want to talk to Emerald, you know, they want to pick her brain, they want to pick her, you know, emotions, they want to, you know, everything. And it's, it's really a delicate situation that people have to really understand that this was a difficult process for Emerald to be able to open up in the way that she did. And I really want to commend her on being able to do that because people don't really understand how difficult of a process it, it, it really was. And, you know, we can let her tell in her own words, but I think there's really been a, a pouring of support. Um, you know, every time I post something about it on social media, just looking at the comment sections and people are, you know, saying then the messages that come and then the calls that come, the text messages that come. And people are really, really proud of Emerald. And, you know, I, and it's funny, I'll just tell this and I'll, I'll let Emerald talk. Um, I remember telling her a long time ago that she doesn't even understand how much of an inspiration she is to other people, you know? And when I, when I told her that, you know, it was like really in the beginning, she was like, what do you mean? I'm an inspiration? Like I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm nervous. I have all this emotions inside of me. I was like, yeah, but you got to understand, you know, unfortunately, there are many people who are going to be in a similar position that Emerald was in as far as losing somebody close to them. Mm -hmm. And even just seeing Emerald have the courage to be able to speak on, on, on like a program or speak in public in any way or being able to open up about her journey and things that things that she's, um, 
you know, had a difficulty with and, and mountains she had to climb and what she realized was going on and all these different things, they're looking at her as like inspiration. Yes. And it's just really amazing to see, um, you know, when you're, when you're hearing that. So I, I couldn't be prouder of Emerald, to be honest with you. Um, she's absolutely amazing. And she's going to continue helping uh, so many people um, right. throughout her entire journey. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for all the kind words. Um, this has been a long journey. Um, we started writing, well, I started writing the book a couple of years ago. Then I closed it up and I was like, no, I'm not going to visit it. Then I opened it back up and then I took it off. It was, it was a lot. And then um, when um, Ms. D and I sat down to actually start writing the book and then Atan signed on to like help navigate the activism mixed in with the past and try to like get all of those things. And my, the major thing for me um, that I, I kept, you know, saying I wanted to, I wanted to be like a manual. I wanted to be like a guide. I wanted to be um, real. I don't want it to be like, oh, I, I think that I felt like this. I was like, no, this is what I'm feeling. This is what happened at the time. And um, we kept going back because it was just like, you know, they want more of your voice. They wanted more from you. They wanted more from you. So when we finally um, got to the title, which was 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 fought a little bit, because uh, it was like, oh, there's so many things called finding your voice, but I'm like, it's not as significant as, you know, as it would mean to me. So um, yes, I appreciate it from all the way back when we did the All-Star Weekend, um, um, the All-Star Weekend event that we did at um, the church in Harlem and doing all of those things, those things contributed to um, my journey and to um, finding who I am, finding my voice, finding a way to figure out how to deal with the children after Erica passed away, find a way to still be an activist, find a way to still be um, executive director, find a way to still be, you know, authorist and do all these other things. I call myself an authorist, don't judge me. But, um, you know, doing things like that um, definitely contributes to the journey. So I'm definitely um, understanding um what it takes to get there. And as I work with other people and other um, survivors, because I don't, we're not victims, we're survivors. Um, when I work with other survivors, it definitely helps to um, make me a little bit stronger throughout the process. So mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to, um, I'll, I'll pass the question to Atan first and then Monet can answer. So through this journey, um, we, we talked about, you know, Erica, we talked about Reverend Sharpton, we talked about um, all of these things. I want to know, from your perspective, um, what do you think the pivotal moment for me was when you realized that I found my voice? Or if you did, if you found it or if you did by writing this book? Well, for me, honestly, um, you know, since we've been talking so much since that first All-Star weekend, I saw it forming, you know what I mean? I saw it kind of bubbling inside of you. And then we started going and, and speaking to different colleges and, you know, schools and middle schools and high schools. So I saw it like more and more and more. And, you know, it, it, it was, you know, but then I also saw sometimes with interviews with the media and they were, and they were like a different version of you. So I remember we was in the one school and I, I, I'm, I'm, I hate that I cannot remember the name of the school, but it was a school that was in the Bronx. Horace Mann. Horace Mann. There we go. So we was a horse man. We're sitting there. There's a middle school. And I, I, I remember I looked over at you and you looked so comfortable and they were talking, they were asking questions. You was like, oh, that was a good question. All right. And then you went there and was asking the question and somebody asked, else asked the question. But then I also remembered when we was on... CNN and it was like there's a guard that you have to put up because there's and it's nothing against the the host of CNN it's just the way the media is they're asking you a question kind of to guide you in a certain way because they already have you know uh, um, an agenda of what they want to focus on and so you know some of the questions came and I saw you tense up even though we were virtual so, you know, we weren't really next to each other. We were virtual. But I saw you tense up, you know, and I saw that, you know, and it, and it was just it, it unfortunate that you had to deal with all of that 
but I saw you growing in dealing with it as you were doing more and more interviews and dealing with the media more and more. And so, you know, I, I did want to ask you about that process as far as learning how, because everybody doesn't always have the best intentions, unfortunately. And you talked about it in the book. You talked about, you know, the exploitation of the media, of, you know, different organizations, of, you know, different people. And how did you deal with that? And how do you continue to deal with that um, as you go along in your journey? And how do you kind of decipher who has good intentions and who doesn't? I think that um, I wasn't given a choice. I think that a lot of the times, you know, they say black women, they just handle things. They just, they just, they just figure it out. And I've always been the figure it out kind of person. So, you know, it's been like, okay, you know, once I um, became an adult, it was like, okay, what, what do you need as an adult? You need a job? You need an apartment? All right, I got that. You know, and then I had my daughter. All right, you need a, a job that's making more money. And then you I got that. So, you know, I, I took care of the bills, did what I needed to do. And I think that, you know, um, having that, that independence early on helped me to navigate certain things because I've worked at a lot of jobs. I've, did, I've done customer service. I've gotten certified in customer service because that's what I really thrived when I was working in retail. So um, I think that it's easy for me to adjust. Um, and once I learned how to how to redirect conversations because that's a that's a skill it is um after yes. watching interviews watching people and watching all of those things um I, I started to learn like i literally sat behind reverend sharpton while he gave his speeches every saturday for years i literally like went places and i watched him speak and i'm, I'm backstage and i'm just like looking at him you know doing his thing and you know writing things down and then people the way that he's doing things so i kind of copied off of his style a little bit. And then I started to travel with other people who speak. And then I started to see other people that speak and do things and how, um, you know, actual uh, speech writers work and, you know, watching how people do those things. I was like, oh, that's easy. I could do that. Because I think that that my brain just like, I'll, I'll just, I'll just figure it out. So mm -hmm. like, I kind of have this figure it out spirit. So I think that that's where a lot of that came from. And, you know, sometimes you're scared to speak up because you don't know what's going to happen. So, right. um, yeah, that's usually how I how I do things. Mm, mm. You know, one thing I wanted to, and I'll let Miss D, um, you jump in anytime you want to. Um, one thing I know that a lot of people um, asked me about was the road, the road that you had to take, and you talked about this in the in the book in detail, um, to get Daniel Pantaleo fired, and how long it took because a lot of people didn't know that it took as long as it took and they didn't know that you know if it weren't for you pushing with the ccrb pushing with in, in conjunction with everything on the, on the steps and all of that that you had to really push their hand in order for them to fire him and a lot of people just you know from what i what i've you know heard they, they didn't know the process so you have a lot of other people who are in the situation saying, okay, I'm going to look at how Emerald did it because now I have to apply that to my situation because now I'm in a situation where I have to fight for justice for my loved one. So just talk about a little bit of all you had to do, you know, and all the people you had to reach out to and all the people you had to, you know, join with and what you had to take up on yourself and say, okay, forget it, I'm going to do this in order to go throughout that whole five-year process to where you finally was able to get him fired. Um, so, uh, yes, we did, we did talk, we did touch on it, um, in the book. Um, but I think that for a lot of the things that we did, it was a lot of showing up. So after the, the federal government decided not to, um, indict, um, that was, that was, that was, that was a problem for me. That was very hard for me. It was, I had a, like a real blow up in front of the courthouse and a lot of people say, oh, that's, um, fighting for justice moment. But when I talk about it in the book, I want people to understand that I felt like that was a mental health breakdown. I felt like that was me being to my limit. So, you know, when, when, you know, we don't get the results that we need, you know, for me, it showed up as anger. So I wanted people to understand, 
like I, I started to push even harder, which was I went to Gracie Mansion and I talked to the mayor. The mayor at the time was Mayor de Blasio. I went there and he was just like not giving answers. He was very vague, talking in circles. And I was just like, you know what? I don't want to talk to you. Then we went over here. I was like, okay, I can talk to this attorney. What is it that we need to do? So I went to attorneys asking questions. What do I need to do? What needs to happen? Okay, you don't want to listen to me? Let me go take bridges. Then we started to take bridges. Then after that, they don't want to listen over there. Then we started to go in front of the um the one police plaza we laid on the floor we laid on the floor in front of the police plaza in the middle of the street and we took the bridge so i was like do you want us to do all of this every day do you want us to disrupt your lunch hour every day do you want us to do any of this all no that's not what we want we want we want justice and we want it now so if you give us justice we won't do these things so they decided to okay well we'll we'll the the judge that looked at the same information that the um that the federal government looked at decided to, that the cop needed to be fired. So it was a lot of legwork. It was a lot of showing up at events, showing up at places, and just making myself known, making myself relevant. I did a lot of work in Harlem. I did a lot of work in um you know with different organizations and different people. Um, and it was just more about keeping it out there and keeping it relevant. So that that was the major part. Wow! Wow! Wow, Miss D. Um, you know, I, I know that there's a lot that we talked about that we touched on dealing with mental health and um, in the book. And I can't even imagine, you know, the toll that this would take on your mental health over this long period of time. And I want you to touch on it a little bit um, and then stress how you really, one of the things that you said that really stuck out in the book was that, um, you wish that as part of, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but um, as part of the settlement that each one of your family members was, was given treatment for mental health and that people do not understand the toll that this takes on you and everyone's mental health, um, they just don't think about it in those terms. So, so talk about you know, how you was able to deal um, with the mental health and the struggles, the ups and downs of it while you're going through this entire process fighting for justice for your father? Um, it was a, it was a lot, you know, I, I definitely have to shout out Dr. Jeff, um, Gordier. Uh, he definitely helped me put a lot of things into perspective. Um, when I did get to speak to him, it was years later after my father died. Um, this was literally like, I think a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. Um, I spoke to him and he, and it was around the time my grandmother was passing. We talk about that in the book as well, you know, having to take on so much. So everything got piled, 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 piled. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, Ms. D will let you know that there's a lot of recordings. There's a lot of things of going and reiterating, going through those things about the therapy and all of that other stuff. Um, so it, I think it was just, you know, having the support system that I had and, you know, having the action items that I need. And that for me, I feel like I, I finally found my peace within the past two years, honestly, um, when the world was forced to shut down, like I really had to shut down, sit with myself in the house every day. So it's just like, I had to figure out what are those things that are gonna make me better. And when we did come out of quarantine, I just made a decision and I, I was very intentional um, about, you know, following through with the things that I've been practicing because uh, I don't want to be hypocrite. I want to practice what I preach. So, you know, if I'm, I'm going to be going into restorative justice, that means that everything around me should be surrounding the, that energy. Um, and I definitely want to tap in with Monet. Um, how did you, how, like, you know, when we, when we did the mental health chapter, when we did, um, you know, go through those emotions, like, how did you receive it? Was it like, oh, well, I didn't know this about Emerald, like stuff that I, you know, that I talked to you about and that we put in the book, stuff that didn't made it in the book. So like, was it stuff that you didn't expect or was it like, oh, okay, I know, I know that to be Emerald or whatever. So was there things that you recorded or, you know, that you took in that was like out of the norm for what you know of me? Okay, well, first of all, I know a lot of you. So, it, you know, disclosing to our audience here, because I've been around since you were a little girl. So, yeah, I mean, you gave me more details than I had before, clearly. Um, but the thing that I enjoyed was the fact that you were, well, first of all, your memory is unbelievable because you just can remember the dates and what corner you were on and what time it was. And I'm just sitting here like, okay, I don't have to remember that. I'll just ask Emerald. And so that was a lot of fun, even though some things were sad because some of those very specific, you know, what was going on outside and what you were wearing or not wearing and 
you know, you talked about, uh, I, this didn't make it into the book, but your broken arm. And, <laughs> and that was just amazing. I'm sure you must have read that a ton. Uh -huh. um, and she just went on and on and on with every little minute detail that I didn't know, all that good stuff. But it was fun. And it was funny. So the thing about you and a lot of your traumas is you you deal with stuff. If you're not angry, you're you're comical. You know, you can make things really hilarious, the worst things, like horrible things. And a person will start cracking up, listening, and then probably crying after they realize the severity of whatever it is that you shared. But I want to just chime in on that. When did you, when did I realize that you found your voice? First of all, you've always had a voice since you were about 10, 11 years old. You just were a little timid because you had these monstrously tall bigger sisters standing around you. And then you kind of grew to their size. So that shifted. <laughs> and um, with this, uh, with these series of events happening, your voice, you just became more and more um, uh, settled in your position of being able to deliver what it is that you have to say. So it, for me, it's just been beautiful watching you become assertive. Although sometimes I'm like, okay, now, now. All righty. But you, you, it is very, very interesting watching you kind of figure your way around, you know, because you've had to take a lot of positions. I mean, did we met? Now, I read the book and I know all the details, but um, just for the audience, you having the kids, you have now three children, and then you had grandma who was my heart, and um, she passed away under your care, and how intense that is. And then you do love your mom tremendously and your mom has her own little moments of stuff and how intense that is for you and your brothers and your sister, you know, you love them. And so, but still in all, you still have to maintain your focus. So it's been interesting watching you kind of navigate your variety of emotions around everybody and loving people, but then getting annoyed sometimes with yourself that you love them so much. And then you know, all that stuff, but then realizing that you were able to put to use a lot of your, your aggressions, if you will, and, and work on your activism. And so for me, I, I think watching you realize that, you know, hey, I'm not just Emerald, because those of you who don't know, Emerald's also a poet. And um, she wrote some pretty interesting pieces that were really cathartic, you know, so you were already on your way. It's just, we didn't know that this is where we we're going to end up. But one day, maybe you'll share those pieces. But yeah, so maybe, watch. Maybe. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know if we talked about Ms. Robin in the book, because um, I started reading it over and then I started crying. So I'll put it down. I'll pick it up, put it down. So, you know, I haven't gotten to that part. But um, uh, Ms. Robin, she was definitely one of the people um, that, you know, helped me, um, you know, get to that that part. So um I'll, I'll see, I'll see what I can do. I might have to adjust some things because, you know, I was a rebel when I was young. So, you know, I got to go back to what I said because I really don't remember. <laughs> I think there's like two, one I, wrote, one I wrote about my mom and one I wrote about my dad. I think those were the two I sent to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, mm -hmm. um, yes. yeah. So yeah, documentary coming soon. We'll see, you know, <laughs> you know, we got to tell Monet, start working on documentary. <laughs> Just push her a little bit, you know, because she's the artiste and she yeah. has that visual eye. And that's what I, that's what I love about Ms. D. Like, you know, that's why I was just like, I know that you'll capture it and I want you to have that visual eye. And um, I know that when it comes to when, when my documentary is going to be put together, I know that, you know, it's, it's going to come because when people read it already, they're like, I feel like I'm watching a movie. And I'm like, that's exactly, I just, I got that feedback from two people. So I know, I know it's real and they feel it. And I'm, I'm glad that people are hearing it in my voice. I want to ask you, Emerald, um, you know, one part that we included in the book was the, the guidance that you received from other um, survivors. And one of them in particular was Rodney King's daughter. And mm -hmm. I wanted you to talk, Ms. Uh, Laura Dean King, and I want you to talk about, how, first of all, how did y'all connect? Um, you know, how did y'all meet? And then how did she really... Um, you know, kind of guide you as far as dealing with, you know, fighting for justice, dealing with your mental health, dealing with emotions, because she she had been through all of it, and she went all through all of it as a little girl, because she was a little girl when, when, when uh, Rodney King 
um, happened. And so I had it talk, talk, talk us through that whole process with uh, Miss Laura Dean King. Um, I absolutely loved our interview. I think it was great. Her energy is always felt, even if it's through the phone. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Um, and it was, it's just an amazing um, thing to connect with survivors. Um, right now I have a, a, a support group, um, you know, from doing interviews and speaking to other um, survivors and seeing their feedback, especially from Laura, you know, I talk about let, in, in the book, letting her know, you know, if my, my story would have been different, if my father would have lived, my story would have been her story, you know, just in a different point of time. So, mm -hmm. um, when we talk, when, you know, as we went through those interviews, um, I, I, I always wanted to point it out to like, you know, this is what we need to do. We need to tell people about our experience because we're, it's not stopping you know, people are still being killed, people are still being murdered. So, you know, they need to know how to handle these things. They need to know how to do this, how not to lose their life like Erica did. And and that's and that's my my goal is for them not to lose their mind or their life. So, you know, focusing on mental health and focusing on physical health, focusing on spiritual health. Um, you know, because my relationship with God with God was very, you know, very shady. I could say I was very shady um because I was very angry. So, you know, I had to really sit with, you know, what what why are you doing this to me, God? Why are you doing this to me, God? And my I started to change my thinking to why are you doing this for me? So when mm. I started to speak to other people, it started to be confirming. So, you know, the, the Healing Justice Village support group that I started, you know, I sit with my women, um, you know, they're, they're women that are um, that lost their sons to um, incarceration, you know, solitary confinement in Rikers Island, you know, unhealthy um, prison conditions and stuff like that. And, you know, from talking to um, Laura King, who, who dealt with the trauma in a different way, to speaking to a mother who lost her son, or a sister who lost her brother, or, you know, a, a daughter that lost their father, or a mother that lost their daughter, or whatever it is, whatever the family dynamic is, it's always, um, you know, I always try to make sure that I'm intentional about their feelings, their emotions, how they're dealing with things, how um, they're feeling in the moment. Um, I have to shout out to Jay. Um, she's on our team. She's uh, worked with We Can't Breathe and she worked with Atom for a very long time. She um, definitely helps to navigate a lot of those questions because we'll get on we'll get on the call and it's just like so much emotions that we really try to take time to break things down. We're not therapists, we're not, you know, licensed clinicians or anything like that, but just knowing what I needed is what we project on them that we needed to break down these feelings. Okay, you know, I didn't attend a lot of the court dates. I didn't attend a lot of the meetings with the lawyers. I didn't do any of that. So a lot of the things I found out about my father's case, I found out on online or on TV. So I, you know, I didn't sit in the, in those places or whatever. And when I did, it was too much for me. So just walking through those emotions that I was not the mother, I was not the executive of the estate. We signed everything over to my grandmother. So she did all of that. We we weren't included in those. So, you know, that that part of it, I don't know, but I just know how I felt. I know how I, 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 dealt, I dealt with my feelings and I know how I got to where I am today. I don't know where I'm going to be at tomorrow. I don't know where I'm going to be at in two weeks, but I know where I am today. And I know that today... I'm okay enough to get out of the bed. And I know five years ago, for me, like them, they can't get out the bed. They don't have nothing to look forward to. How do you tell a woman who has only one child that lost her son in a tragic way to come to a birthday party or to come to an event where you see people with children or to uh. see somebody like me that lost their father and now I have to see Father's Day stuff or my niece that lost her mother, Mother's Day stuff. That is very uh. hard. And, you know, to, to see that. And she sees it every day. My daughter's calling me mommy and she's calling me auntie because she knows that she's missing her mom. So from like, you know, just breaking those feelings down, breaking those things down, it all contributes to mental health. It all contributes to what you're going to do for the day. Are you going to go through the day thinking about this tragedy and letting it break you down? Or are you going to try to overcome just a little bit so that you can just be sane enough just to make it through the day, through the week, through the month, through the year, through those things? So... That's, wow. that's really what I try to focus on. Wow, wow. Well, one thing I wanted you to touch on was getting the Eric Garner Law passed. Um, and it was absolutely amazing the whole path that you took to be able to push to get that passed. Um, you got to pass on the state level. I know you're still pushing to get it passed on the federal level, but getting it passed on the state level means um, so much. So talk us through what it took for you to be able to do that. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, the kids, they're running around, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> 
yeah so um the, the the process as i said the process was was a lot a lot of me showing up a lot of me doing a lot of the a lot of the leg work and i think for other people they need to um definitely um understand that we're in a voting year it's time for you to definitely step up your vote matters your vote counts as we can see uh we need people to get to the polls we need people to get the people we want in and the people that we don't want out you know we have to figure out who our legislators are we need to figure out who our community people are um and we need to actually rock the vote this year we need to we need to vote black we need black 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 all up in the white house so we need we need we need our laws to stay the way they are we need all of those things so we need more people that look like us to vote for us so that we can make changes. So for people that are wondering, you know, what I'm going to need, what support I'm going to need, I just need people to realize who's in the seat. And if they deserve to be in the seat, then they you vote for them. If they don't, you vote for the person that deserves to be in the seat, that understands the larger agenda, that we have to keep our voting rights, that we have to make sure that our our that we don't go back to segregation and all of this stuff. I know that Reverend Sharpton just spoke about it on Saturday. The Saturday just passed, I did a book signing at Reverend Sharpton's office. He broke down what we're going to lose. So I encourage everybody to go to YouTube and go to the last Saturday Action Rally from Saturday um, the 8th and watch that because he broke down. I don't remember everything he said, but he broke down what we are going to lose if we don't step up and vote. So how we got the law passed, the Eric Garner law, that's not going to matter if this vote in term does not turn out in our favor. So I encourage everybody to go and look um, at that at that um, rally because he definitely broke down what's at stake. And we have a lot of things that I said we, we made a lot of progress. We got three laws passed with the Eric Garner law. So let's not forget Stefan Clark law and the Andrew Kish law that got passed with the Eric Garner law. And we had a majority vote. I think it was like two people that voted against each law or something like that. But we got it passed. It's done. Um, but it it won't be, it won't be, it won't mean anything if we don't step out and vote for the right people. So I'll have more information on my website, www.wecanbreathe.net, um, because it's really important that we follow these legislators and we make sure that they're in for us. We have a couple of questions. You, well, I want to say this real quick. You broke you broke that down in the book as far as the Eric Garner law and how you were able to push for it. But one thing I wanted to just, you know, say, you, you say real quick, you had some people that supported you and then some people that said they were going to support you, but then didn't support you. And I like that you, the way that you described that in the book. And I just thought of that now when you're talking about how important it is, you know, that people vote, um, you know, you went directly to the politicians and said, I need you to support this bill. Or this, I need you to get on board with me and do this. And I thought that was just so amazing for you to do, especially while at the same time you're still grieving and still handling your, you know, battling with your mental health. So I just wanted to say that real quick before we before we go to Ms. D. I, it's, it's, it's an amazing, she tells the journey in the book. She tells all the different steps that she had to um, take and the the bumps that she had that she came up against, how she pushed through them, and you know, talking to this politician and this politician, and it's really a great blueprint for other survivors who are in this situation in, in different cities of what they have to do in order to be able to get laws passed. Because the only way that things change is when you make it illegal for somebody to do what they did, and then you have them held accountable. So the, she goes by the step by step. So. Go ahead, Misty. I'll say. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> no, because there's so much for us to talk about all the time. But um, 90 90 percent of whatever is as discussed here with us and in any setting, actually, Emerald's just so brilliant that, and you know, of course, we are. So we pulled everything all together. So the Emerald covers these things in detail, as you just mentioned, um, right. from the, the 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 guide on on passing laws, from a media a drama, right? From 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 paying attention to your mental abilities and or your mental traumas and so we have a question here and actually we had a statement first um and i'm going to do the second one that the person wrote up here her name is uh, vanessa p reefer thank you vanessa um uh, the thing is um what do you, she says, what, what you're describing is called trauma-informed care. Remember when you were talking about that a minute ago? Mm -hmm. And she says, we all benefit from you and survivors like, like you turning trauma pain into activism as a method for healing, which is what I was saying that you did, which is one of the major things that I love. I really think it's great. 
And, uh, and, and then she asks, how do we book you for speaking engagements? We'll get you that one. um yes so trauma informed care so I went to school for social work I didn't graduate yet you know I had other obligations with taking um the children um and when I was in school we learned a lot about trauma and you know therapeutic and you know doing a lot of the things and one of and and I'm familiar with um though with that term um trauma-informed care and you know long-term grieving and you know things like that so I think that um it's like I think that it's it's super important that we understand what type of trauma we're facing. Uh, we're in different categories. We have to understand, you know, what what is the low point, what is the high point. Um, that's why I, I like intimate conversations and and close conversations with the people um, that I can relate to because you know sometimes I say I'm not having a good day, I'm having a bad day, but that don't mean send you know the people to my to my door so they could lock me up for 72 hours because y'all think that I'm going to do something to harm myself. So no, I want people to understand that I have I have a I have a bad day and I just need to work through those emotions so that mm-hmm. I can get where I need to be and I think that um a lot of the times you don't know what you're feeling so it shows up as other things. Um so I love to like dive deep into all of that and you know like every like even in the book I have a a, a chapter called mental health and we really, really dig deep into that. And um, I really want to encourage people to read the book. I don't want to tell it all, um, <laughs> but I do want people to read the mental health, um, the mental health um, chapter because that that was that that was when I was really vulnerable. And I want people to know that it's like you know, this, you know, you have to know you have to know what you need, and sometimes you don't know what to ask for. Exactly. But I want to jump on this one because Vanessa asked another uh, uh, question as well and or actually made a comment. It was really lovely, to be honest with you. Um, She says, thanks for this inspiring conversation. It's great to see that you're in conversation uh, and community with so many other survivors and people involved. Um, But then she says, um, in the struggle for justice across generations like Laura King and Ilyasa Shabazz, kudos to Ilyasa. Um, and then she says, I wonder if you could talk a little more, because you don't do this in the book, but how their perspectives inform your activism. That's one you don't do in the book. Yeah, well, right, you- <laughs> oh, you're about to- um, yeah, so um, I think that it, it helps me to understand more because the trauma that I'm dealing with is not the trauma of a mother. It's not the trauma of, uh, you know, an aunt or anything like that. So my my hurt is a little bit different. Uh, my trauma is from my father and my sister. So it's just like, you know, seeing seeing that trauma, actually sitting down and speaking to someone um, who didn't, didn't lose their, like my, my father lost his life to a chokehold. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Stefan Clark, he was shot to death, you know, um, um, turn my car alarm off. Sorry. Um, it, it's just a lot. It's just a lot of um, different different perspectives when it comes to the trauma that we face. So the activism. Um, I think that more of the activism part comes from um, just the understanding. Like we have this silent bond where it's just like I understand you. I got you. I know what you mean, and they actually believe me. Right. Right. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. What would you like people's um, takeaway to be? You're you're muted. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? It's breaking up a little bit. Yes, I was saying. What? Oh, I'm sorry. That was not Vanessa's question. That was someone else's question. So I apologize. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, apologize, anonymous attendee. Um, but what would you? What are you hoping? Um, what is your desire for the for people's takeaway to be of, of finding your voice, finding my voice? What is it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I want this to be used as as a guide, like as Atan explained, like a way to understand some of those things. Like this is this is this, these are feelings that are going to happen: the hopelessness, the anxiety, the depression. All of that stuff is going to hit you all at one time. And mm-hmm. it's, it's all I'm saying is take a minute. Take a minute to 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 take in to to not be exploited to not be overrun to not just get exhausted with life because that's that's where you'll you'll get if you don't take care of yourself. So um, 
with We Can't Breathe, my organization that I started for my father and my sister, um, we want to start doing uh, care packages, um, you know, just for people to, you know, just just to have a little little bit of encouragement for people who, who state who face state violence. Um, so we'll have that up on the website soon, just how you can get one of those packages just to help you set on your way. We'll probably include a book or something like that. And we'll just do those things. And, you know, uh, we realize that togetherness actually help us mm -hmm. like togetherness without cameras, uh, without moderators, without, um, you know, not, you know, no, no, no reporters or nothing, just having raw, authentic, you know, conversations, um, mm -hmm. peace building, you know, just, just figuring out what it is, how, I, what is, what is your lane? Like I found my lane, but maybe you don't know what you want to do yet. You didn't find your purpose. You don't know what that drive is to get you out of the bed in the morning. And, with, and I'm, I just want to be a part of figuring out what that is. And that's what I wanted to turn into. That's what I aspire for it to be. Very nice. You know, you, know, you talked about um, We Can't Breathe uh, in the book for, for an entire chapter. And you really laid out why it's so passionate, why you're so passionate about it and so passionate about helping other people. Um, I wanted you to just explain that a little bit. And it's, it's again, it's still so amazing to me that while you're dealing with so much you know, with yourself and internally and, and your mental health that you have this passion to go and help somebody else with their mental health and everything that they're dealing with. And it's, it's, it's absolutely, you know, amazing. But just talk, talk to me about your passion um, in doing that, in the work that you're doing with We Can't Breathe and you're doing with Jay and the restorative healing and everything else like that. Um, I think that it stemmed from the work that I did at National Action Network. So after uh, my father was killed, Reverend Sharpton gave me a job. I talk about that in the book. Um, and, you know, it was just mo more so finding what my place was. And, you know, I did crisis and I did, I co-chaired the march and I learned how to organize. And I learned how to do a lot of things. And I was just like, you know, you know, we have Rainbow Coalition that does this. We have National Action Network that does that. We have this organization that does that. We have Guns Down Life Up. We have Erica Ford, Peace of the Lifestyle. We have all of these, all of these organizations um, that are focusing on different things. And I was just like, you know, I don't want to be like every other organization. Um, I actually want to do things that they're not doing because they're already taking care of that. So I, it's easy for me to say, oh, if you need peace, you need healing, you need this, um, you need to go find their bus because they do healing, they do Zumba, they do this, they do that. I want to refer people over to that organization. You need a lawyer that you need to talk to because you don't know if the lawyer that you have is somebody that's on your side or you just don't know and you need lawyer resources. I send you to Nan Legal Night. Go talk to Attorney Hardy. Attorney Hardy will hook you up with another attorney that can help you out. Then you talk to Mr. Schmokin. They have, you know, Glenn Myers. They have all of these attorneys that you could get a meeting with, you can have a consultation and that'll get you somewhere. Then you have this organization that does this. I I want my organization to be the part where it's like, I understand what you're going through. I'm here as a survivor with you. And I know that they're offering you all these other great things. I'm offering you a non-traditional way to figure out what your place is in the movement. Because we can't just go to a therapist and just lay it all out on the line because there's family trauma, there's issues in the family, people doing this, people saying that, people doing this. And it's like, where do you break away for, to people that understand you? Like, you know, even when I, I talk about the huddle, the huddle is a, a, a youth program that happens at NAN. And that's where I started. I, you know, I going to the rally was too much for me. All of the cameras and the media. And, you know, I stopped sitting on the stage because I started to get anxiety. I was, I'm seeing all these pictures of me crying. But then I go to the, to the huddle and I go back in the background, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I, I look at those organizations and you could get certain things from there. So when we when we started the, um, when we revamped everything and started We Can't Breathe Incorporated, um, <laughs> excuse me, it was with Erica and with, um, with my dad and mine, and we kind of merged it into three pillars under the Justice Project. And um, that's how the Justice Project was born, which our three pillars were After Five for Justice, which is a youth crisis hotline that works, that operates from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. If you have an issue, you can call, you can talk, nobody's gonna judge you. If you just need to ramble and get it out like me, like I did a lot of times, um, we're here for you. It's, it's only three of us, so bear with us, but we're we're working on it. We have we have the time and we're here. And then we have job development where we'll help you with your resume, your LinkedIn. Um, you know, one of our board members has a great connection with Dress for Success, and you know, she'll send to get business clothes and make sure that you're ready for your interview to see you. If you look good, you feel good. So 
know, that is that is Diane's department. And we, you know, we help them with the resumes, the LinkedIn, social media, you know, make sure you have a business, a business card, you know, whatever it is that you need to help you develop where you need to be. And then my favorite pillar is um, Hearts for Justice, which is which is where our healing justice um, support group was born under the non-traditional Emerald way of finding your purpose. Um, and that's just where we focus on mental health. Um, we're planning a big retreat. We wanna, you know, raise money and bring the women and 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 um, we wanna do women first and then you know, we'll, we'll worry about the guys later. But right now, focus on my ladies, um, you know, and the mothers to just take them somewhere, have some real planning and healing and crying and laughing and having just just one of those moments where it's like how do we go to the next chapter like we talked about this in the book we did the mental health we did all this so how do we get to the next level and I think that a lot of you know a lot of uh conversation and a lot of building around that is what I really want so my three pillars in the organization are those things and I want people to receive that there's there's other type of support and you can have your therapist, you can have your psychiatrist, you can have all of these things, but you can have an additional resource that's just of people that are just there for you. And I, and that's what I really needed the most. People that were there for me, people that had my back, people that were like, you know, I know Emerald and I know that this is, this is what her heart desires. So I don't care about all this other stuff, but I know this is what she's good at. I know that this is, this is where her purpose is. I know that she's good at this. She's good at that. So those are the type of people that I want to support the people that need it. Great. That's great. I mean, I, I can't say enough how, you know, admirable this is that you have the heart, you know, to help, you know, other people and you want to help other people and you're using, you know, what you've gone through um, in order to help them. And so it's like, uh, you know, no, I know what you've been through. You talk about this in the book and you talk about the difficulty. And one thing that I really, I really saw was you're giving people what you wish that you had when you first needed the type of therapy and you talked about the certain type of therapy that didn't work for you. And you're, you're giving one person and they're, you know, they don't have any personal relationship with you. And they're asking you these questions. You're like, why are you asking me? You know what I mean? It, it just didn't work. And so now what you're providing for these other people is the type of therapy that would have helped you. And I, I just think it's really admirable, but I know it's amazing. We went through an hour that quick. Um, I know we have to bring our host back on. He had to have some housekeeping um, things that he wanted to do. But I want to tell everybody, buy this book. Um, There's so many people that this will help. This will be, this is a book that can be very helpful for activists, for people that want to be allies, for, for people that have organizations um, and things what not to do. This will be helpful for the media and when and how when they're dealing with other impacted families, things not to do. Um, not to feel, have them feel exploited. Um, and then uh, definitely other impacted family members. This is really a blueprint on the way that you can pursue justice, the way that you have to have your, your circle tight and you know what, what you have to kind of weed people out and what you have to look out for. You lay it all out so beautifully in this book. So I just want to say kudos to you. Um, everybody buy the book and uh, we'll bring our host back on so they can finish up the, the, the housekeeping things that they have to finish up. But thanks again, everybody, for listening. Thanks for that. Um, this has been so inspiring and very wonderful to listen to. So thank you, all three of you, for doing this here with us at Community Bookstore. Um, looks like we have one more question from the audience if we want to get to it in the next five minutes. Um, Trudy Walker says, thank you so much for having this forum to discuss an important issue of justice and your experience with your father and sister passing away. Mm -hmm. I uh, love that you're using your story to help others deal with their personal struggles. And Trudy asks, does your organization have any volunteer opportunities? Yes, absolutely. We are actually um, going to start doing a book tour. So um, we're going to try to figure out like some more events, some more things to get some things out of there. So um, you could definitely reach out to us through the website or um, um, the uh, the email that is attached to the website is info at wecanbreathe.net. Um, you know, we have um, three people um, on the staff and we have we have a team that's helping out with some of the things. So I'm just trying to have a lot of um, volunteers come on. We are trying to secure 
fingers crossed, a contract with um, Department of Education. Can't really talk so much about it, but I really want the contract really, really much, um, but it'll be working with the youth and I definitely need help with, but, you know, from mental health specialists and, you know, from teachers and from people who really, you know, work with children um, so that we can get this initiative off the ground. So um, please email me, info at wecanbreathe.net, send me your resumes, send me everything, send me your portfolio, profile, you know, whatever it is, send it all <laughs> so that we can look through it and um, actually get a team together um, to help these young people. You know, we're, we're trying to really get these young people to start being political figures and, you know, police officers and judges. And, you know, I want fire firefighters and stuff like that. Like, let's get our young Black people in a position of power. <laughs> Fantastic. So there you have it. There's the uh, volunteer opportunities. Um, thank you all again so much for this, Emerald, Eitan, Monet. This has been such a such a wonderful evening. Um, and especially thank you for all of your hard work. We're grateful to you for sharing your story with our community. Um, those of you at home, please do consider purchasing a copy of Finding My Voice from Community Bookstore. Check out wecantbreathe.org. Uh, get involved and vote, of course. And we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thank you again for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.